Good morning. Good morning and uh, Happy New Year to you. Uh, I, uh, I have to comment. I've been seeing on, uh, on the Zoom, I've got to see Donna Waller on there. Donna will be um, our lecturer for the last three lectures of this uh, course. So good to see you, Donna, and good to see all of you. Um, and uh, welcome back. Um, this is a course that um, uh, we've all been looking forward to for a long time. We've, it's been a year we've been, we've been talking about this. Uh, and of course, it deals with our American history and uh, history that, that goes back in time. Maybe some of us um, followed this in high school. We were just talking at lunch and about the fact that very few of us really took history courses in college um, with the sciences and the languages and, and all the requirements. Um, so some of our, our uh, academic experience with history goes back to high school. And now as we are uh, older, have different perspectives, um, I think these stories will have even more meaning. And I think this is uh, something we're all going to enjoy. We have two wonderful lecturers um, who will be contributing to this course, Richard McMaster, who you'll be hearing today, will actually be doing the first three lectures. And then Donna Waller, um, um, who's uh, spoken to us so many times on a political and history subjects, will be wrapping up the last three uh, lectures. Um, I'm just going to leave it there. I think this is going to be a treat to all of us. Thank you to Richard for getting us started. And let's have some fun today. Thank you. Uh, I hope I hope this doesn't distort so much, uh, but we'll, we'll do the best we can. Uh, we're probably all of an age where we remember the Democratic and Republican conventions when they really were conventions, when we had. India Edwards banging on the gavel. Will the delegates please take their seats, which of course they never wanted to do, and backroom deals uh, before television, listening on the radio, and uh, suddenly uh, another candidate was emerging than the one we'd anticipated. And all of that has been kind of killed by primaries and all these other uh, newfangled inventions, television included, so that uh, the convention really becomes rather more like Oscar night than its uh, coronation and uh, a uh, opportunity for rising stars to be seen and heard or at least be seen. But we're going back to a period before there were conventions, when it was assumed by the gentleman who made this kind of decision that the president would be picked by a friendly caucus of senators and congressmen who would agree that it was Mr. Madison's turn or well, uh, I think Monroe should get it this year. And this all began to go, turn sour in the 1820s when uh, Andrew Jackson, an incredibly uh, driven, uh, ambitious man with many other advantages, uh, turned American politics upside down. And uh, as a result, they were flailing around for a way to nominate a president. And especially as we'll see, if you had a party that didn't really have enough people to caucus in the halls of Congress, how would they go about it? So this is why we've focused on what is really the first national convention of a major party 
in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 1839. So let's see what, what we've got here. After uh, Jackson came in, as I say, he turned American politics upside down because <clears throat> Jackson was a man whose strongest uh, drive was personal loyalty. He required loyalty of his friends, his voters, his Congress, and largely in uh, veto messages, laid out the principles that became uh, Jacksonian democracy. Jackson was elected in 1828 on the simple notion of virtue. We had had the corrupt bargain in 1824 that had put John Quincy Adams in the White House. So Jackson was running as a man of integrity, but what did he think about national issues? Where did he stand on economic issues? He didn't tell us that until in office, he began writing veto messages and you wouldn't dare cross him once he had laid that down. So uh, you, you can see the, what the Democratic Party was now tied to. A federal revenue is limited to a low tariff on imports and an excise tax on alcoholic beverages, nothing else very limited kind of, of, uh, of uh, revenue source. There would be consequently no federal appropriations for canals, roads, or other so-called internal improvements. There would be no central bank to govern the economy. Jackson spent his second term in the bank war. And there would be no government subsidy for private business. He was very much a man of, of laissez-faire. Let businesses rise, fall, let banks open, close. It had nothing to do with the government. The government's role was to be quite limited. Well, naturally enough, his opponents developed a parallel list. They wanted a high tariff to protect our infant industries. They wanted federal support for internal improvements. Jackson had argued in uh, a bill vetoing an appropriation for a road in, in uh, Kentucky that if the people who lived there wanted a road, they could organize a company and build it. They didn't need any government stepping in. And they also wanted to recharter the Bank of the United States to turn around uh, everything that Jackson had stood for. And there is Jackson, a veto memory, King Andrew the first. Martin Van Buren is really the father of the Democratic Party. They all still have Jefferson Jackson dinners, but uh, they should have Van Buren dinners because it was Van Buren and his experience in the so-called Albany Regency running the state of New York politically that uh, organized the Democratic Party. Thurlow Reed led the anti-Van Buren faction in New York and saw an opportunity in the anti-Masonic movement. Weed and other people noticed that practically every member of the political elite was also an active Mason. And consequently, they saw in a movement that started in Western New York, a very localized kind of political movement, 
an opportunity to ride that, at least in the state of New York. This had arisen because a man living in, uh, in the Rochester area had decided he could make a little money by publishing a book or pamphlet uh, explaining all of the secrets of masonry. And uh, he was subsequently found floating in Lake Erie. Now, that may have been a coincidence, but Thurlow Weed and other people said, oh, no, the Masons are too powerful. It's Mace Masonic people like Jackson and Van Buren and all of their cohorts who are destroying this country. So we need to organize a party. And the anti-Masonic party held the first national political convention, but they're a splinter party. All right. So can we get this video now? The Democratic anti-Masonic nominations. William Word of Maryland, who turned out to be a Mason, had embarrassed them. Okay. Third party movements in American history have. Huh? How do we get that full size? Oh, there it is. Huh? Third party movements in American history have been likened to wildfires on the prairie. They have intense heat, but they burn out very quickly. The anti-Mason party was not on the political scene very long, but they did leave us with one innovation, and that is the presidential nominating convention. A new deal for the American people. Extremism in the defense of liberty. There is no substitute for victory. The United States of America. Freemasons were a secret society, a fraternal organization that originated in Europe, became popular in early American history. They were businessmen, lawyers, doctors. They had rituals and secret handshakes and all that good stuff the ordinary people were uh, not supposed to know about. And in upstate New York, a fellow named William Morgan decided he was going to write a book and publish all the deep, dark secrets. The Masons abducted Morgan. And they took him to Niagara Falls, and he was never seen again. What other political party originated in a kidnapping and a murder? There's the sense of deep uncertainty about the future of America, and this scandal taps into it. So the era of the founders had just ended, and there was this real fear and question about whether American democracy could survive. George Washington had been a Mason, the sitting president of the United States, Andrew Jackson, the Democrat, was a Mason. <clears throat> Henry Clay, the nominee of the National Republicans, was a Mason. So the feeling was that here's this secret group all these people who were controlling the government belong to. People said masonry has too much power, and it's irreligious, and there's too much drinking, and they have all these regalia and fancy titles. That's unrepublican, and it's secret. In a republic, everything should be out in the open. Over time, anti-masonry steamrolled, and it was really the first mass movement, and very much a populist mass movement, and the first third party in American history. What it was was a revolt basically against the elite classes. Up until the 1832 election, you had a system where members of Congress were selecting the next president. They would take a vote as to who the parties were gonna run that year. It was a very uh, unpopular system because it gave the people no voice in selecting presidential candidates. The anti-Mason movement, which just started and had only a couple of members of Congress, could not have a caucus because it would not be a meaningful thing with just a few people in the room. This is a mini election within the party, deciding here's who we're gonna put forward to run for president. That hadn't been done before. The leaders of the anti-Mason party thought they had their candidate lined up in John McLean, sitting justice of the United States Supreme Court. 
Only a couple of weeks before their convention, they got a letter from McLean saying that he would not accept their nomination. The anti-Mason leaders decided, well, we'll invite some prominent people to attend the convention and maybe we'll get some good press out of this. And what happened next is almost comical. William Wirt had been Attorney General of the United States. If he had not lived in Baltimore and he had not attended the convention, the anti-Masons probably would have nominated someone else. The grand irony is that he himself was a Mason, and there's actually a great quote where he addresses the convention and basically tells the anti-Masonic party that there's nothing wrong with Freemasonry. Almost immediately after the convention is over, Wirt wrote to the party leaders and he said he wanted to withdraw as a candidate. They said, absolutely not, you're in. But he took no part at all in the campaign. So the first political convention in the short term is a total disaster. They import democracy into the way that the party functioned. And then they end up electing someone who undercuts everything that they stand for. It's a fascinating example of what it takes to run a democracy. Anti-establishment feeling is kind of the heart of American political culture. As a nation, our founding spirit is really one of anti-authoritarianism. The anti-Masons, big similarity to 2016 is opposition to politics as usual. Their anti-politician attitude stamped them as a populist movement. We can see anti-establishment undertones in both parties today. At least for now, both of these movements are operating within the existing two-party system. Okay. Right. Third party movements in American history. Right. Can Should we kill that now? Thanks. And can you get back to what? Who's next? Yes. All right. The Whig Party, which uh, dominated the the anti-Jackson movement and absorbed the anti-Masons was dominated by Henry Clay of uh, Kentucky. He was a candidate in 1824. He was a candidate in 1832. And he was anticipated to be their candidate in 1840. In the 1836 presidential election, the Whigs did something different. They did not have a convention, but they allowed states to choose favorite sons, so they had three candidates, three Whig candidates, and they hoped thereby to deny Van Buren a majority in the Electoral College. And the South Carolina Democrats, smarting from the nullification issue, uh, nominated their own anti-Jackson Democrat. It was a disaster, as you can see from the map, where the blue states are Van Buren states. Van Buren won handily in 1836. Now, in that uh, unfortunate for the Whigs 1836 campaign, they had uh, presented two individuals, both of whom were military, distinguished military men, uh, William Henry Harrison, the victor of Tippecanoe, and who had gotten more Whig votes than any other candidate in 1836. Harrison has been the govern territorial governor of Indiana and was living in Indiana on a rather large property that he had acquired. He was a member of a very distinguished Virginia family of uh, planters, uh, we might say, of, of the Virginia or aristocracy. Winfield Scott, a career military officer, 
had been badly wounded at uh, Lundy's Lane during the War of 1812. He had fought at Queenston, and both men were rising stars in the in the Whig Party. But the nomination was not expected to go to them. These are the candidates from uh, 1836. You'll notice in the center there is, is uh, uh, Daniel Webster, and that he is holding a, a placard that's around his neck that says Hartford Convention, and that uh, because he was a New Englander, he was believed to have been uh, of doubtful American uh, loyalty because in 1814 at Hartford, Connecticut, a number of then Federalists had gathered and were prepared to secede if necessary in order to put an end to the unwinnable and uh, unbearable War of 1812. But as the 1840 election approached, Clay was the inevitable candidate. The Whigs decided this time they would borrow the idea of a national convention with delegates from every state who would nominate a single candidate for president and another for vice president. They met in Zion Lutheran Church in Harrisburg. The church had just just been finished. It was a brand new building and the largest auditorium anywhere in central Pennsylvania. And it's still obviously there. And this is the the interior of the church, which would have been very much like what the delegates saw in 1839. Some state delegations were very large, others small. So they had a rule that whoever had the majority of a state's vote would get all the states, would get all the votes of that state, winner take all. And that's important. When the first ballot was counted, Clay was in the lead with 103 votes, mostly Southern states. Harrison, however, was close behind with 94, and Scott had 57. The second ballot, had the same result, but 128 votes were needed for the nomination. So he was roughly 25 votes short of being nominated. Clay and Scott awaited the results at the Astor House Hotel in New York City. When we remember that there is no telegraph no telephone, no uh, easy way of getting information. They might, for all practical purposes, have been uh, uh, totally out of communication. It would take, after all, someone leaving the church in Harrisburg, taking a train to Philadelphia, taking another train to New Jersey, I think it's Hoboken where the uh, Pennsylvania ended. There was no tunnel under the Hudson River, taking a boat across to Manhattan and bringing the word to their hotel. So they were always going to be 24 hours or more out of sync with what was happening in Harrisonburg. On the third ballot, Harrison lost a few. Scott picked up a few more. And far from gaining the 25 he needed, Clay lost eight votes. The fourth ballot had the same result. You'll notice in, in this contemporary drawing, uh, <laughs> Henry Clay is reading the New York Tribune. He had to wait for the newspaper to be delivered to find out what was going on in Harrisonburg. And 
behind him are all of these other Democrats with drawn knives waiting to uh, stab him in the back. So we got into the fourth vote, and now the dam broke. On the fifth ballot, Scott delegations from New York, Michigan, and Vermont moved to Harrison. Harrison had the nomination with 148 votes. Clay Loyalists held on and gave him 90 votes, and Scott trailed with 16. Scott was a much younger man than he appears in that picture. When the news came, Clay was playing cards in the Astor House with Winfield Scott and Congressman Crittenden of Kentucky and Evans of Maine. When he learned what had happened, he accused Scott of treachery and started to beat him savagely, severely injuring him. He had a wound in his uh, left shoulder from Lundy's Lane, and when uh, Henry Clay started beating him with a walking stick or something, his pain was excruciating. Later, Scott sent Crittenden to challenge Clay to a duel. So we almost had two candidates not fighting it out at the ballot box, but fighting it out on the Weehawken dueling gr grounds across the Hudson. Crittenden, ever a peacemaker, persuaded Clay to apologize. You may remember that Congressman Crittenden of Kentucky was responsible for a last-ditch compromise in 1861 to placate the seceding states and keep them in the Union and avoid the terrible Civil War. So he was always a man interested in making peace. Before they adjourned, convention delegates chose John Tyler, a Clay loyalist from Virginia, as vice presidential candidate. They were so desperate to find a vice presidential candidate that they interviewed quite a number of individuals who all turned the job down. But someone pointed out that when it was clear that Clay was not going to get the nomination, uh, John Tyler had been seen with tears running down his face. So they decided on that basis that he was a true Clay man, that he would uh, bring all of the Clay people back into the fold. Well, they really didn't need to worry. William Henry Harrison was the oldest man to be nominated for president up to that time. And Clay Diehards hoped on the grounds that he was so old, I don't know what he was, he was like 60 years old in 1839, that was pretty old. They thought, oh, he'll, he'll just step aside and Clay can take the, the nomination. And a newspaper in Baltimore quoted one of these uh, unfortunate clay men as suggesting that General Harrison would probably be happy to retire on his pension to a log cabin with a jug of hard cider. Well, that was just an item in a Baltimore newspaper. But Thomas Elder, a lawyer in Harrisburg, saw the story and said, here's the 1840 campaign strategy. And there's Harrison, who lived in a uh, really uh, splendid house in, in uh, Indiana, it's now a national monument. You can go and visit it. He did not live in a log cabin. 
We don't know that he cared for hard cider, but here is Harrison and Tyler uh, as hard cider in the log cabin campaign. Fuller Weed reemerged, directing national fundraising, and Horace Greeley publicity. And here is a whole lot of, of uh, there is General Harrison on his, on his horse, and scenes of different battles. Tippecanoe apparently is presented in a number of places there. And there is, uh, uh, in the lower left-hand corner, uh, Harrison emerging from his humble cabin. And some of the cabins are over there. And the music, we, we'll, we'll pick up a bit of this. That very large picture on the, on the extreme right is of the ball. And they uh, had these balls with the uh, indication of the uh, county or the or the city delegation that was supporting Harrison and Tyler, and we wanted people to keep the ball rolling. And here's Timmy Canoe and Tyler too. That cabin gets smaller and, and uh, humbler almost every time it's depicted. And there's a a banner, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. Uh, Richard Mentor Johnson, who was Van Buren's vice president, was to run on a somewhat similar. Uh, idea. He was not a tippy canoe. That was a battle in Indiana. But he had uh, he had been the man who actually killed, or so he claimed, killed Tecumseh at the Battle of the Thames in in Ontario. And uh, so they were chanting, "Rumsey Dumsey, Colonel Johnson killed Tecumseh," and. Uh, he he was a very colorful character. Uh, and in April, an obscure Pennsylvania congressman, and his, this man is is really an obscure congressman, delivered an indictment of President Van Buren in the halls of Congress, depicting him as a sybarite who charged taxpayers for all sorts of luxuries, French wines, lace, eau de cologne, and so on. None of it was true, but it didn't matter. That's the important thing sometimes in politics. If you say something loudly, and especially if you have it read into the congressional record, then the newspapers or the media today will spread the story. So there is a beautiful goblet of White House champagne and, and a rather evil looking Martin Van Buren uh, enjoying his fine finery. So they chanted, uh, Van Buren dines on dishes of gold and reclines on a gilded settee. Harrison sits on a hardwood bench, content with hard cider is he. And here's the hard cider campaign, which is really the way it was done. They brought kegs of, of uh, hard cider out and everybody got to have a drink at, at the local township rally or whatever it was. And part of it was, was uh, by my old professor, Bob Remini, uh, when he t told us this, I thought, no, that's, that's too good to be true, all right? But it was, it was true that in uh, a couple of areas, and I'm not sure whether it was Ohio, I think it might well have been Ohio, and 
that the hard cider was supplied by a uh, merchant of of alcoholic beverages whose name was E. Z. Booze. <laughs> and they were having a good time with that. Now, Van Buren has a hard row to pull, to plow, out of hoe in this case. Uh, there's Jackson on the right, and he, Van Buren burdened with the sub treasury idea, which was uh, one of his uh, administrations. And you will notice there uh, that the uh, signpost is he's trying to go to the White House, but the signpost there is okay to Kinderhook, which is where his home was. And there are some uh, folks over the years who have argued that okay came from the 1840 campaign and it was old Kinderhook. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. Uh, Woodrow Wilson always wrote OK, WW, on papers, and he spelled it OKEH. But that's not 1839. So here are some more. There's there is uh, the humble uh, Harrison uh, plowing himself. And here is a, uh, a rally. And you'll notice on the sides of the picture, it says, uh, keep the ball rolling. So we're having a general meeting at the old courthouse on Saturday evening, and there with a band behind them uh, as one of these balls they're rolling and it says on to Medina Timmy Canoe Club of Cleveland we need old tip to guide the ship Timmy Canoe and Tyler too so they roll these big balls and from one township to another to keep the ball rolling on election day, Harrison and Tyler carried most states north and south. So here we have the trap sprung, the kinderhook fox caught. Uh, Harrison is lifting up the building with uh, a hickory post. Jackson, you remember, was old hickory. And here are the states that uh, Van Buren had not carried Ohio, Maine, Massachusetts, Vermont, and so on. William Henry Harrison was now the president of the United States. And as you know, he was only a very short time in office after he uh, was inaugurated. He died in office, and to everyone's surprise, the man that they had found as a kind of last ditch compromise, John Tyler of Virginia, was now the President of the United States. And in his uh, administration, Tyler found himself totally isolated. He had no possibility of being nominated by Democrats or Whigs as uh, for a second term. But he will figure very distinctly in the campaign of 1844 because of some actions that he took that will uh, mold what became that. But that's next week's story. So if you are all 
uh, good boys and girls. Uh, Uncle Wiggily will be back next week to tell you about uh, James K. Polk and the election of 1844. So we have hopefully some questions that I can or can't answer. And perhaps on the Okay. Um, can you hear me? Um, thanks, Richard. Uh, one thing, Richard, um, that you said early in your talk that you would come back to was that rule about winner take all um, in the convention state by state. And I think that had a big impact on Clay's opportunity didn't it, to, uh, to gain the nomination. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, whoa. What happened? <laughs> Suddenly. <laughs> oh, okay. No, it it uh, it mattered there because the the several smaller states with smaller numbers of delegates weighed in in the same way as as a large state, eighteen thirty nine, for example. The New York delegation and the Pennsylvania delegation were very very large, and uh, so. Yes, there were a lot of individuals there, but but it had to be the ultimately the state who who uh, and and that, that's the way it is in the in uh, when an election goes in the House of Representatives that it it isn't by individual congressmen, it's by the congressional delegation from that state, so they have to somehow. Uh, caucus or agree that uh, the votes of New York will go for whoever, and and that's what they were doing in the convention. Here they were they were uh, doing the same thing. So the, so it became very important when the three Scott states left him and went over to Harrison, and that made Harrison the candidate. I used to have a, uh, I'm, I'm rambling at you now, but. Eighteen forty campaign that uh, I had picked up in a, in a book sale for 25 cents. And unfortunately, I lost it with a number of other things. When we were moving to Florida, there was a, a box that didn't make it and it was in there. But th that was uh, really a, a fascinating little thing because it had a biography of, uh, of Harrison, you know, all skewed to the idea of his being a humble, simple, hard, uh, cider drinking uh, country boy. And uh, it also had some other interesting uh, items in there, such as the uh, attempt, which the uh, 1840 campaign did not think was a good idea, to have uh, a kind of Pan-American Congress that had been uh, suggested by Simon Bolivar, and uh, they discussed that as something that was undesirable in this uh, little pamphlet. But anyway. Uh, oh, wow. Any other, any other questions here from the audience? I don't need this mic. Any questions for Richard? I, I, Richard, I did want to dig deeper on this um, 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 issue of uh, uh, that one state takes all. As I understand it, Clay had support in all those states, in New York and in Pennsylvania. Yes, yes. And, and 
had they had they counted individual delegate votes, they undoubtedly, I think, would have won the nomination because <laughs> the whole state delegation had to go to the to whoever won that state. That really pushed it. Yes. Yes. Yes, indeed. Clay, uh, Clay tried so many times to become nominated to be president and never did make it. No. No, he was always, he was a perennial candidate and dominated the Whig party. So you would think he, he would have had no difficulty, but inevitably, I think, uh, as you read through some of these things, but it's a case of one man is the, the preeminent member of our party. And that means there are a number of other individuals who are entirely opposed to him just on that grounds that uh, I'm, sh I'm surely as competent as he is. I should be able to, to uh, be the nominee or, or to be the kingmaker in that case. So we have in, in actually in each one of these early conventions, we have a front runner who seems to be the obvious candidate and the unsinkable candidate. And somehow there are the individuals in his own party who are saying, you know, anybody, anybody but him, you know, it's any, anyone but Kevin. You know, we don't, we don't want, uh, we don't want him, but no matter, we don't have a viable candidate, but we really don't want him. So in, uh, in the case of, of uh, Van Buren, and in the case of Douglas, it's the anti uh, people in their own party that work very hard to to see that that uh, they're not they're not the nominee. So, hello. What? Uh, the convention for next week. Oh, next week is the Democratic Convention of 1844. And it begins with uh, a very simple uh, decision that Van Buren in 1837, when he became president, had inherited a economic depression. The country was uh, really reeling through much of his administration. He did not uh, get the uh, nomination in 1840. He wasn't even uh, particularly uh, well. He, he, he just didn't happen. And uh, in 1844, he wanted to have a comeback, as did Henry Clay. So Clay and Van Buren met in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they signed a joint declaration that this campaign, if we are the nominees, and neither one of them, it turned out, was, if we are the nominees, that we will be pledged to the economic issues that had defined our respective parties, and we will not be drawn aside to talk about an annexation of Texas or uh, increasing our hold on the Oregon Territory or claiming to find a way to take the United States to the coast at California by buying 
those territories. And as you probably remember, the 1844 election turned on the idea of purchasing California from Mexico, annexing Texas, and 54-40 or fight, take the Oregon line all the way up to Russian Alaska. So we'll see how that all came about. Aha, uh -huh. Paul. Yes, Richard, enjoyed it very much. Delightful insight into campaigning, particularly. Uh, it, we don't have as much of a sense of humor, I don't think, as they did then, uh, nor a uh, artistic bent to uh, make the cartoons that were very seemingly very effective because they did result, I guess, in the uh, uh, campaigners, the candidates, in picking what cartoons were doing. Uh, that aside, uh, I'm just curious, did people when they uh, were going to vote or register to vote uh, have to indicate a political party? Or was that, uh, and, and, and was there any way anybody could tell what the, what the votes were by party rather than by the, the name of the candidate? Yes, the, uh, right, through, right through the 19th century until we adopted the Australian ballot in the, in the early 20th century, you voted with a party uh, ballot. So you were, you were handed a Democrat ballot or a Whig ballot uh -huh. and you marked it. So they they knew perfectly well that uh, right 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 through the the whole of the nineteenth century they knew perfectly well when you obviously voted for the Democrat for governor because you had a Democrat ballot usually with a, a rooster on it and uh, or you, you, you were voting the Republican ticket. You really didn't have much choice there. So that was the way in which, uh, to come to the very end of the 19th century, that uh, we hear so many stories in 1896 of how uh, employers were uh, intimidating their workers that you know you would vote for McKinley or you won't have a job well they they didn't have to uh, have any strange kind of surveillance they just noticed you either had a McKinley ballot or you had a William Jennings Bryan ballot and uh, their poll watcher was making a note of these so it's it's uh, it was just the way they did it. They they, they uh, didn't have any way anybody had an option for an independent or somebody else or the uh, anti Masonic party or whatever because they were not uh, they didn't have a ballot to pass out and and there was a, some kind of restriction at the state or local level or federal level as to whether uh, you had to have. Uh, one of two parties to uh, mm. to vote. I'm wondering, did this is this in any way where two party system emerges, but uh, becomes embedded in our political mind? Well, in in the in the 19th century, you actually had numerous parties at different times. Yeah, that's right. and they must have had a way to to allow their adherents to vote. So they, they must have printed up their own ballots also. Yeah, the, when Lincoln becomes a, you know, runs on the Republican ticket, I wonder how they implemented that. They, the, the old G, the, I guess they, because they, they, the Whigs bowed out and, and uh, or at least disappeared in that 
Lincoln election, and he didn't run as a Whig. Oh no, no. Uh, 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 all, all through that uh, period, just before the Civil War, there were numerous uh, splinter parties that uh, lasted for an election or two and then disappeared. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I think, yeah, then this is not, uh, you, you can disagree with this, is the suggestion that the two party system really comes after the Civil War. Mm. That you have Democrat. Democrats and Republicans, mm. and it's periodically you will get a populist party of one kind, and you will have a uh, socialist party that, well, especially yeah. around the turn of the century, did quite yeah. well in some places. But uh, 1930s, it did well. So, how, how fascinating. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, I hope you all come back. <laughs> <laughs>